Again, welcome back, second day of Applicative. Uh, and without further, further ado, Ben Moore, who's going to talk about uh, Facebook at scale. Cool. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how we scale Facebook and what we do to, to sort of manage all of the services and servers that we have running. Um, so I've been at Facebook since 2010. Before Facebook, I co-founded a company called reCAPTCHA. We created those squiggly letters that you see all over the internet um, that you use when you sign up for new sites. Um, and we use them not only to protect against spam, but also to help digitize books. Um, at Facebook, I am the tech lead of the Web Foundation team. So our team is responsible for the overall performance and reliability of all of Facebook's user-facing products. And what this means is that we have two roles. So our, the first part of our role is proactive. We help work with all the design or the teams at Facebook that are designing pieces of infrastructure and work with them to proactively design their products and the, t and the tools that they build for developers so that they are efficient and that they, in the face of failure, fail gracefully. We're also reactive. We know that sometimes this mission is going to fail and sometimes there are going to be outages that are going to be problems. We work, we debug uh, our systems. We are sort of the, the, the last line of monitoring where, where we monitor the overall performance of the site. And if some other team doesn't, through their alerts, catch problems, we will see them, we will investigate them, and we will help root cause them. We often work with, it, with problems that have, uh, you know, sort of, that are complex, that involve multiple teams, and we'll help interface between those teams as they're debugging an outage. And so I think that this, and th so this mission, the second mission, the reactive mission, actually plays a lot into the proactive mission, where we will, we will go through one of these incidents, we will learn a bunch of stuff that, hey, this system failed this way, that system failed that way, and we will put that back into the proactive mission, where we're going to those teams and we're saying, let's talk about how, you know, this incident occurred, and here are all the things that we learned from it. Um, and so today, I kind of want to give you guys a taste of both parts of Web Foundation's mis mission. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we do to proactively design our site to scale well, and, if, and the way that we reactively handle an incident, and how we go about doing that, and how we go about learning from it. So to sort of frame this talk, I think it's useful to give a quick 30-second tech talk of how Facebook works. Um, so I'm mostly focusing on the, the user-facing parts of Facebook. And all of that, it, it's you know, the desktop site, it's also our mobile applications. Both of those are over HTTP, so this is our sort of our stack of what happens when you make a request to Facebook.com. First, when you request something from Facebook, it goes to a set of load balancers that is distributed across POPs across the world. Those load balancers figure out the, the right data center to send your request to, and they forward it to what we call our web tier. Um, this is our, uh, our business logic tier that is running PHP code using our uh, HHVM runtime for PHP that we've created in-house. Uh, and so this web tier is sort of where the, the real brains of Facebook are, figuring out, OK, you know, this user is logged in. What does their website look like? How, what, do they, uh, you know, what do they see when they go to the site? The web tier sort of uh, switches between talking to two different sets of services. The first service it talks to is a cache service. That is a service that has information about objects in the social graph, about users, about things that they posted, about comments on those posts, about likes on those posts. It is a graph of objects that is connected together with associ associations. This cache is backed by an underlying MySQL storage system. But this graph does not necessarily contain everything that's on your Facebook page. Your newsfeed isn't a graph. It, there's, we have to figure out what all of your friends posted. For these kinds of questions, we have services. Now, there's only, there's only really one cache, but there's a lot of different services that range from everything from newsfeed to timeline to messaging to ads to ranking to spam detection. These services are built by different teams that operate the services on their own and the, the web tier uses uh, Thrift, our RPC framework, to call into these services. Facebook is an environment where there's a lot of rapid change. We release the, the business logic, our web tier, twice every day. And sometimes features are developed at, at a pace for someone who's responsible for making that website work that can make you a little bit seasick. Um, 
One really good example is the look back feature video we launched last year. This was to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Facebook, and we offered you the ability to create a video montage of all the stories that you've ever posted. Um, this feature used 450 gigabits of egress. We rendered 720 million videos at a peak of 9 million per hour and used 11 petabytes of storage. From the time that some product manager said, it'd be really cool if we did this, to the time that we launched the feature was 25 days. With this kind of timeline, there's not a lot of time to design the scalability and to, you know, to, to work with any individual service team as they're launching a product. And so what this means is that as we're building our systems, we really need to have a code base where anyone can come to the company and build a service and build it scalably and build it efficiently. And what that means is we need to make sure we're solving scaling problems only once. The way we do that is Facebook projects are all built in a single source control system. So there is one Git repo that has all of Facebook's code in it. And what this means is it's really easy if you have a useful piece of code for you to expose it to other teams. So we have a bunch of libraries that started off as one directory in one folder that one team said, hey, I really need you know, an RPC service. And that very, can very quickly evolve into a company-wide RPC framework. And so we have um, some really cool libraries. We have Folly, which is our base C++ library that contains a lot of useful utilities. We have Thrift, our RPC framework, which helps coordinate the, both the client and the server um, RPC calls. Um, Proxygen, our HTTP server, which is used to power that load balancer that I talked about earlier. And RocksDB, which is a persistent key value storage system. All of these projects have started off as something that one person used and was, was helpful in one project and have changed into something that is not only used across the company, but now all of these libraries are open source. Um, in the presentation that I'll put up on the, on the site, um, these will have links to the, the GitHub repository for each one of these projects. So one of the libraries that I've found has been really useful and is uh, applicable across a wide range of, uh, of, of applications is synchronization libraries. Facebook has a lot of large multi-threaded programs and having the right abstractions for people to use that predictably scale well is extremely important for delivering high performance. Um, one abstraction I want to talk about today is producer consumer queues. These are co commonly used, for example, in our Thrift RPC framework. If you have a, a Thrift request that comes into a server, that's usually handled by a thread that's using an event-based system, something like libevent, and will hand off that piece of work to a consumer thread which will execute the work for that request, which might involve database calls or might involve something that you wouldn't want to run on your event thread. Now, the most obvious way to implement a producer consumer, consumer queue in, in, uh, in Linux is to use the pthread con t in, in the pthreads library. Um, but if you look at how this performs, at, with 50 worker threads, everything is fine. But as you get up to a lot of worker threads, you get up to 200 worker threads, the performance of pthread con t gets really, really bad. What's also really interesting is that for each piece of work you put into the worker queue, you find that you're doing three context switches just to send that piece of work to another thread. Now that's really weird. Why would you do three context switches if you just wanted to send one piece of work over to one thread? You'd expect to see maybe one context switch if there was a system call every time you know, a piece of work was put in or less than one context switch if you were able to do that wake up in user space when the queue was full. Um, so if you go dig into the, the glibc pthread con t library, um, this is sort of a simplified version of what you would see. And you notice in pthread con wait, there's a loop. And the loop says, look at the futex value, and futex is the abstraction that, that Linux uses to wake up, um, wake up things in synchronization code. Um, look at the futex value, um, unlock a lock that was held, call into the kernel, see if the value is still the same as you had before, reacquire the lock, and if, it, if I didn't successfully you know, acquire the, or find a wake up, then just go back into this loop. And when you signal a pthread, what happens is you acquire a lock, you increment the futex, and then you just wake up one other person. So if a lot of people are waking up things and a lot of people are waiting to be woken up, 
what happens is people get into a storm where they keep on the, the value of the, the few ticks variable keeps on going up and no one can ever see a consistent value of the few ticks. And so they keep on calling few ticks wait and saying, is there a new event? But instead of saying there's something here, the kernel says, well, your view of how many things were in the queue is different than when you went last got woken up. So you should just try this again. So this is why we're seeing multiple wake-ups per item. Um, another problem with using pthreads to do a synchronization queue is that pthreads naturally wake up threads in first in, first out order. That means if 10 threads are waiting on a uh, pthread uh, con t, then the f when, you wake, when you signal a thread, it'll get a piece of work, and it will then do the piece of work, and it'll be put all the way at the back of the queue. So the next, the next thread to be picked up by the P thread would be the last, the black one that's least recently got a piece of work. Compare this to last in, first out order. In a last in, first out order system, a thread would execute a piece of work, and then it would go all the way back to the, it would go all the way to the front of the queue, so that the next time a piece of work came in, that it would be, be handled by the thread that most recently did a piece of work. Um, so what we found is in a lot of applications, it's, real, it's really important to schedule work on threads that have recently been executing. This is sort of a basic idea in anything that has cache locality, is that you want to execute your work somewhere where there's a hot cache. It's also really important for memory usage. In a first in, first out system, if you have a million worker threads, every single thread will get used every once in a while because you'll just go one by one through the queue and be like, okay, this, one, get, this guy executes one, this guy executes one, this guy executes one. Um, so a lot of systems have per thread caches. In particular, malloc has a per thread cache, which caches small objects that that thread has recently allocated. And so if you've got a million threads, now you've got a million threads worth of malloc caching, which uses a lot of memory and wastes a lot of space in the CPU cache. In a last in first out system, the only threads that are actually needed for executing work get executed. If you have a million threads in a last in first out system, the, the millionth thread will never be touched because there's never a million concurrent pieces of work. Um, so what we found is we've actually saved three to five percent. We found three to five percent efficiency wins in, a, in real world applications simply by switching the order of threads that we're using from first in, first out to last in, first out. We've also found that if you cooperate with malloc, you can save a substantial amount of memory by using a last in, first out system and releasing the memory of idle threads. I've linked here to an HHV, a segment of HHVM code that shows you how to release memory in either JE malloc or TC malloc. Both of them have APIs that let you release memory from idle threads. So combining these two concepts, we came up with an abstraction called LIFOSEM. LIFOSEMAPHORE is an efficient last-in, first-out semaphore that allows you to easily build a producer-consumer queue. LIFOSEM is 13 times faster and has 12 times fewer context switches than the pthread conditional variable uh, implementation of a producer-consumer queue. So it's actually a pretty substantial performance win in high performance applications that are queuing a lot of things, even in something that's getting 100 you know, items through the queue per second, it's a really big efficiency win because of the last in, first out prop nature of uh, giving you better cache utilization. So pthread con t isn't the only synchronization variable, synchronization method in, the, in pthreads that we found to have efficiency problems. The pthread mutex implementation has this uh, really hairy problem where when a mutex is under high load, you'll see lock contention, but not lock contention on the actual lock you're acquiring, but lock contention on the lock inside the kernel that's used to handle contention on futexes. Um, there is actually a, a patch proposed to the mailing list that created a new futex API that would sort of be more cooperative with the pthreads mutex implementation and allow you to enter the, the futex sy system call fewer times when you had a contended mutex. Now, if pthread mutex is bad, pthread reader writer lock is terrible. Um, if you, any of you guys have ever used pthread reader writer lock in a real application, if, you're some, if it's something that's IO bound, you're fine. 
but you've probably experienced that for something that uses a lot of CPU, pthread reader writer lock is actually it can actually be slower than a pthread mutex. The reason for this is because pthread reader writer lock, when you're acquiring a reader lock, has to acquire an exclusive lock on the data structure that manages the lock itself. Uh, in Folly, our open source C++ library, we have a spin lock implementation that is much, much more efficient for CPU bound work. And we're actually working on a, uh, a sleeping version of that lock that will be appropriate for both CPU bound and non-CPU bound work. So I've talked a lot about how we manage the, uh, the, the worker threads in a producer consumer system. And that's really important because you want to manage the, the set of work, the, the threads that, threads with, that are really hot execute work that you're, do, that execute the new work that's going into the system. But we've also found that managing the work that's going into the system is really important from a reliability standpoint. And that's because when a system is overloaded, uh, the, the queue in a producer consumer queue is, acts as a buffer and buffering can cause, can either be used for good or it can be used for bad. So good queues help systems deal with bursts of load. In a good queuing system, requests are coming in uh, slower than they are being processed. So the system is able to keep up with load as it's coming in, but there's a temporary burst. A good queue increases reliability. Imagine you had a Java server and the server had a garbage collection. During that garbage collection, you might not be able to keep up with the rate of incoming requests. But overall, after that garbage collection executes, you can catch up and you can start executing the work that, that came in while you, were, um, while you were busy doing the garbage collection. And so in that system, having a queue makes the system more reliable because you don't drop those requests that happened you know, while there was a temporary stall. In a bad queue, the, the server is simply overloaded. Requests are coming in faster than you can process them. A bad queue doesn't increase the throughput of your system. If you just can't keep up with the rate of requests, no amount of queuing will make your service faster. But what it will do is it will cause latency for every request that comes into your system. So I think there's a few things that are important to think about when you're designing a system that has a queue. Uh, if you have a system that has a queue, when you fail, it's better to fail quickly. When you have a system that is, you know, on, that is being used by a, uh, you know, by an overall larger request, if, you're, if your system is slow to process that, you know, that one sub part of the request, you slow down the overall response. But often if you just said, look, I'm just not going to be able to handle this, then it would be fine, like that small segment of the page, maybe on a Facebook page, the people you may know section where we show people you might want a friend doesn't show up. But that's fine as long as the page itself returns in a reasonable amount of time. So it's really important that if you're gonna fail, you fail quickly, but also that when you fail, you actually signal that failure to your clients. Another interesting thing about queuing in server systems is that ordering doesn't really matter. So if you went to the grocery store and Someone from the grocery store pulled you aside when you were in the checkout line and said, sir, I'd like you to actually come up to the front of this line and I'm going to check you out right now. People might get mad at you. And in, a, in the real world, we expect queuing to be first in, first out. We expect to wait in line and wait our turn. In a server, no one knows if we let one user cut the line or not. And so we can do whatever we want to. We don't have to serve people fairly. And the insight here is that we should probably try to give the best service to users that we think are actually going to see our response. If a user has been waiting around for 30 seconds to get their response, likely they've already stopped using our app and they're, st they're using Tinder or they're using, they're using something else. They're, they're, they have been distracted. They're not actually there to see that response. So if we see a person in the queue that's been sitting around for 30 seconds, we shouldn't prioritize them, even if they're the, they're, it's their turn. We should prioritize a user that is more likely to actually see the, the, the benefits of the work that we're doing. So another, real, another really important philosophy is that clients should defend, defend themselves. Now, we want servers to signal to their clients, hey, I'm overloaded, I can't handle your question right now. But clients should also be prepared for servers whose load shedding mechanisms aren't working 
or where the servers themselves are so broken that the load shedding mechanisms can't even execute. Clients should help, should assume that servers will, will help, but not rely on it. The last and I think most important philosophy is that the more complex your system, your knobs are for handling load shedding, the, the less likely they are to work in the real world. Um, most people op tune their system for normal workloads, not for, uh, not for outages and incidents. And so what we found is that it's really important to come up with algorithms and with systems that have very few knobs and they can be easily tuned and give strict guarantees. So one of these algorithms um, is a controlled delay algorithm. And this is inspired by the controlled delay paper um, that was published around reducing buffer bloat. So the key insight of, of both the paper and the, the controlled delay algorithm that we use is that if your processing speed is greater than the rate at which new requests are coming in, that means that there's frequent, there, your queue of work is frequently empty. You can think about this logically. Imagine that my boss is giving me work and he's giving me work at a rate that uh, I'm able, I'm, I'm doing work faster than he can give it to me. Logically, that means sometimes I'll have nothing to do and I'll be browsing Reddit. Right? Um, on the other hand, if I'm doing work, if the boss is giving me work faster than I can do it, what that implies is that at some point, I'm just going to have a pile of work on my desk and it's never going to become empty because he's just giving me work too fast for me to process it. And this is the key insight that controlled delay uses. The theory behind controlled delay is that we check, every once in a while we check if the queue has been fully drained, if it's empty, within any time within the last n seconds. If it hasn't been, if for the last n seconds you haven't been, your queue hasn't been empty, we simply say anything in the queue from now on that has been there for more than 10 to 30 milliseconds, we're going to time out. So back to the work analogy, this is me saying to my boss, look, for the last week I've had a pile of, of work on my desk and I haven't been able to do any of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock off everything except for one or two things and the next time you give me a piece of work, if my list of work to do isn't mostly empty, I'm just going to ignore you. Um, so what this does is this is really great because it means that you can't have a sustained situation where you have buffer bloat, where there's just a queue that's sitting around that you're just not draining. Um, another, so we complement this with something that we call adaptive LIFO. Now I talked about LIFO in the context of ordering which worker thread gets a, a piece of work. This is LIFO in the context of which piece of work do we execute. Now, in first in, first out order, as I talked about, the user who gets, who gets served next is always the user that's been waiting around the longest. And as we said, if a user's been waiting around for 30 seconds, they probably don't even care about the, what your, the, the request that's being done. They probably already abandoned your application and moved on to something else. So the idea of adaptive LIFO is that we generally want to be in first, out, first in, first out order. If the server's under normal load, we don't want to get into a situation where there's a request that's just been sitting around forever because there's always someone that comes in right before it. But if the server is starting to build a queue, then we want to switch into last in, first out order. At that point, we want to say, look, there's just a queue of waiting requests, and so we're always going to give service to the guy that just came in. And what will happen is, Naturally, if the server is overloaded, there's going to be some requests that are at the, the, the uh, end of that queue that are never going to get serviced. Eventually, the control delay algorithm will kick in. It will notice that the queue hasn't been drained for a while. It will time out all those requests, and it will prevent the queue from getting long in the future. So these two systems together give you this really nice property where under normal load, you don't shed any requests. You, if your server is starting to get overloaded, you start focusing your effort on requests that are most likely to benefit the user, and that if it's overloaded for a sustained period of time, you start setting your timeouts very aggressively to prevent people from sitting around in that queue. And what's really nice about this is that the, the, tunes, the, the tuning parameters for this are actually generally pretty broadly applicable. You need to tune the number of seconds that you scan backwards in history for the queue, and you need to set the, the parameter for when do you switch from first in, first out to last in, first out. But what we found is that those parameters are generally pretty applicable across a broad range of services, 
and that they don't require a lot of tuning. Now, I talked about before how the client should not assume that the server will act in a rational way and that it may not execute these algorithms. So to mitigate against this kind of situation, we use concurrency control in clients to cap the number of, of uh, requests going to a given service at once. The philosophy of concurrency control is that we say in somewhere like our, our web tier that's calling a diverse set of services, if the web tier sees you know, at any given time, more than 20 requests outstanding to some service, let's say messaging. If I see that there's more than 20 outstanding requests to the messaging service at any given time, the next time a request comes in for messaging, I'll say, wait, there's too many people that are, looking, that are trying to talk to messaging right now, so I'm going to just fail your request because it looks like the messaging service is overloaded. What's nice about concurrency control is it, it prevents too many requests from from being stuck on one service at any given time. So if something like the messaging service is, is down but is not returning errors, it's just sort of a black hole and sucking up the requests, there will be you know, 20 threads that are waiting on the messaging service. But after that, any new thread that tries to call messaging, we'll just say, look, all these guys are already stuck on messaging, so don't talk to messaging right now. What this, this is really good at protecting a service like the web tier that talks to a heterogeneous set of services where, the outage, where you want to prevent the outage of one service from bringing down the overall, uh, the overall service that you know, calls all of these other subservices. Um, so I've talked a lot about queuing in the abstract. I want to go through an example of queuing that you can actually fix today. Um, and to go through this, I want to just walk through how, um, what happens in Linux when you get a new TCP request. So I'm opening a TCP request to a server. I send it a SYN, and it goes into the SYN backlog. The server will send back a SYN ACK, and the client will send an ACK. This ACK will put the, the request into a listen queue. The listen queue, once a request is in the listen queue, the kernel will wake up anyone who's waiting on the, the listening file descriptor. You can call accept, you can take the, that request from the listen queue, and you can process it in your application. So what happens if the, the SYN backlog is full? If the SYN backlog is full, you send out a SYN cookie. And this is, you know, this is to uh, basically protect you against a SYN flood. So who knows what happens if the listen queue is, is overflowing? Does anyone know? What do you think happens? It's dropped? So it actually is dropped. We literally take the packet that comes in and we drop it. The theory behind this is that networks have, are expected to be lossy. They're expected to drop packets. And so if we drop an incoming packet, no harm can come. It's just as bad as if you know, some uh, cosmic ray just you know, corrupted the checksum of some packet and you know, got, got dropped by some router somewhere. Um, so the Linux kernel source code says that this is a, a mechanism that rather than resetting the connection, rather than aborting the connection, increases the reliability because it, it translates a, a connection that would have been an error into one that simply experiences packet loss, just like any other connection on the internet. Um, so how does this work in practice? In practice, usually just waiting around and hoping things will get better isn't a great strategy when you have a large piece of infrastructure. Um, and in practice, the time, the, by the time the client you know, does retransmissions, the server will ha not have improved its state of affairs. So what will eventually happen is the client will time out. It'll say, I'm gonna wait up to five seconds to connect to this service, and I will, uh, after five seconds, I'm just gonna time out and return an error. So by dropping the packets, instead of sending a reset, we actually translate a situation which would have been a fast failure into a very slow failure. Um, we have found there's a, there's, a, there's a syscoddle in Linux, TCP abort on overflow, that changes this behavior back to the RFC standard, which is to send a TCP reset. Um, and we've actually found that the implementation of this syscoddle is a little bit buggy, um, and so we've open sourced a patch that does a better job and that, that sends a reset in a, a broader range of situations. This setting, this one setting, has prevented Facebook from going down a number of times. Seriously, it is actually, there have been outages where a service 
was just too slow to accept incoming connections, and that by setting this option, rather than causing all the people upstream to delay and further propagating the problem, we just said, hey, the server is overloaded, and they were able to handle it gracefully. It's a setting you can set today. It's something that's, that is, I highly recommend. Um, so what happens when you do have an incident where you know, Facebook goes down because you know, some of, one of these queuing settings wasn't set, or some, something else crazy happens and there's, there's a bro broad, widespread outage? How do you respond to these kinds of incidents? That's sort of the second half of the mission of the Web Foundation team that I talked about earlier. So I think that when there's an incident, it's really important to keep the big picture in mind. I've seen so many times where you know, there's an outage that, that is, you know, people are, you know, they're stressed, they're, they're trying to deal with this, this situation, and they get so locked into what they're doing that they can't see the bigger picture. So what I found is that when handling an incident, it's really important to sort of keep the big picture in mind and focus on communication and brainstorming. One way I've found is really helpful to kind of get unstuck from uh, an outage where you know, people are just kind of locked in is having a bunch of questions to ask yourself. Some of the questions I like asking are, what is everyone doing right now and what's our plan of attack? Oftentimes, I'll see an incident where one person is in front of their computer trying to debug the incident and there's 20 people standing over their shoulder. That's not a great use of time, right? Now, it's, it's, sometimes it's useful to talk about a problem and, and sort of get other people's feedback, but when 20 people are behind the shoulders of one person, you're not actually being very productive. And so making sure you figure out what is everyone supposed to be doing? How can, how can pe people play their role in the incident? Can help get people from you know, watching someone else type into the terminal to sitting in front of their own computer and thinking about new approaches to solving the problem. What is the current hypothesis and what would disprove or prove that? So the, during an outage, you have, to, you have to have some sense of what the problem is that's, that's causing your outage. And sometimes I'll see people get into this, this path where they have a hypothesis. They think that you know, so, such and such problem caused it. But they're not sure that it's a hypothesis. And if you have a hypothesis, it's important to get evidence to, to either prove or disprove it. Because if you prove it, that means you can focus your, your plan of attack more on that root cause. If you disprove it, you should probably be doing something else. And so getting people to think about, hey, here's, here's a theory that we have. What do we do to confirm or deny that that's actually the problem that we're trying to solve? What can we do to quickly mitigate the impact? Can we revert? <coughs> a lot of times people will be handling an incident and you'll, you'll be trying to root cause it and figure out, oh, I changed this one setting and now my server is, like, now everything is failing. Why does the setting break everything? Sometimes the easiest way to fix the problem is just to undo what you just did. And so what we found is that people, people will kind of forget that step. They'll be like, I want to understand why. When you have an outage, you want to figure out what the quickest mitigation is for the impact. And sometimes that mitigation is something as simple as turning a feature off, reverting a change that you just made, something that is quick, decisive, and predictable. And so thinking about these types of strategies that might seem a little bit you know, dramatic and a little bit overdone, sometimes that's the, the best way to mitigate the damage of a, of a problem. What's an alternate strategy we can pursue? A lot of times there'll be someone that's, they're focused on one path down the road. This is, this is the way we're gonna do it. And it's useful to have people working on two paths of attack. Sometimes there's stumbling blocks on that one path. It's, you know, it might be that we need to change some piece of code and getting that piece of code compiled and deployed is taking a while and having someone else that says, oh wait, I found the option that I can change that mitigates this problem. Having someone work on that other plan of attack can help reduce the time to solve the incidents. What do we need to do in 10 minutes? A lot of times resolving an incident has a lot of serial steps in it. First you fix the root cause of the problem and then you fix all of the collateral damage that's been caused during the incident. Getting people to think 10 minutes ahead of where they are and priming the pump to get that other recovery phase done reduces the overall time to solving a problem. Finally, the last and I think most important question is who else do we call? When there's an incident, especially if it's at night and not everyone is around, there's, you know, the right people might not be in the room. And so just 
when there's when there's an incident, being really quick to say, hey, we need to get someone else's input. Let's let's call them up. Let's get them online. Um, these questions for me can really help take a incident from a uh, a phase where you're you're sort of all you're all sitting around that one computer, all going down one path, not really sure what's going on. Everyone is stressed to a situation where everyone is working on slightly different aspects of the problem. They're thinking ahead of where they are right now, so they're they're um, planning for the next 10 minutes and planning for the, the overall resolution, and that they're going down multiple paths so that all your eggs aren't in one basket. Once an incident happens, it's really important to learn from it and to use it to increase the reliability of your system. I can't count the number of, of abstractions that we've built that are an artifact of some incident that happened and the response to that incident. In fact, a lot of the things that I've talked about today, the, um, the, the queuing algorithms that we've come up with, have all been responses to real world incidents that are broadly applicable to our code base. Facebook does a weekly incident review um, across the entire company, and many teams do their own internal incident reviews. The goal of these kinds of reviews is to share knowledge of what happened, to document how the incident was handled, and to come up with action items that make the site more reliable in the long run. Now, when you're doing an incident review, there's actually two kind of counterexamples of doing incident review that people fall into. The first one is that people sometimes feel really nervous about being invited to one of these things. And I use invited in quotes because it's not really an optional invitation. Um, and it's not an optional invitation that's in front of a lot of really senior engineers and leadership at the company. And so I've seen people get really nervous when they come into this meeting. Um, now, we're, we know that everyone makes mistakes. Facebook has a, a, a slogan of move fast and break things. And when that's your slogan, you can't really blame someone if they break something. Um, incident review isn't about determining blame. It's not about saying someone did a bad job. It's discovering ways to improve. Um, we had an incident uh, just, just a, few, uh, a few weeks ago, I think, where a person who had just joined the company um, you know, like literally like weeks beforehand, changed some variable at like 10 p.m. at night and took the whole site down for an hour. Um, now, uh, they were understandably a little bit concerned because um, you've just joined this company and <laughs> you, you come in and you take down one of the world's largest websites. From our perspective, we said, why was this like new person able to take down all of Facebook? Why, like how, how did we let that happen? We thought of it as our fault. Because really it is our fault. If, we, if our system is so fragile that someone new to the company, just by accident with no bad intent, takes down the entire site, that's our fault. And so I think that's a really important mentality to keep in mind when you're doing incident review, is that the person who caused the incident isn't to blame. It's the, the environment that allowed that incident to happen. And the goal of the incident review is to improve that environment. The second thing we see in incident review is people come in with, with uh, action items from the review that essentially boil down to, we're not going to do that again. Now, Facebook does not hire people to, for their insight that when they do something wrong, they shouldn't do it again. That's not, that's not why we hire people. Our hiring bar is a little bit higher than that. Um, and so it's really important to make sure as part of reviewing incidents that the action items from those incidents don't essentially mean, I'm not going to do that again. You need to figure out ways that prevent broad types of outages or broad, broad types of danger that are present in your system and that prevent them. Um, and so a framework that, that one of my colleagues came up with that I, that I really love for sort of thinking about these broad action items is called DERP. Um, and DERP stands for Detection, Escalation, Remediation, and Prevention. This is a set of areas to focus on when you see an incident that can help you think about ways to resolve it in the long run. So the first question in DERP is how did you detect the incident? Was it automatic or did one of your users email you in to tell you that the incident was there? Um, if it wasn't automatic, what kinds of alarms and dashboards can you add that will let you uh, find the incident easily in the future? Escalation, did the right people get involved? If you had an alarm, but it didn't go to the right person, that it went to a different team that had a different responsibility, and they had to escalate it to the other team, then 
how can you make it so that the alarm is better routed in the future? Remediation. What are all the steps that it took to get from the point where you detected the issue to the point where the issue was resolved? In each one of those steps, what can you do so that the next time a similar issue happens, that the issue will be fixed faster? So we'll see cases all the time where you know someone will do something, and then someone who's operating the system will need to do 10 manual steps to resolve the situation. Oftentimes, the best thing to do is just to make sure that the next time that set of manual steps needs to happen, it's not a manual set of steps, it's automatic. Finally, prevention. What are the types of, of things that you can do to remove the risk of failure um, in the overall system? What can you do instead of, even if you are going to fail, can you fail gracefully? Can you fail fast in a way that maybe doesn't prevent the incident, but, reduce, but mitigates the impact of it? So I think DERP has been a really useful framework for me in just thinking about when you know, I see an incident, what are the kinds of questions to ask in reviewing that incident and you know, getting action items that don't essentially boil down to, well, I'm not going to do that again. And finally, I think it's really important to think bigger than yourself. It's, uh, it's really common to come into incident review and see, see teams come in with responses that maybe aren't, I won't do that again, but that are very specific to their team. So a really common version of this pitfall is someone will come in and they'll say, I have this rare but critical feature. And it failed, but we didn't notice it in the noise because you know, my feature was when you, you know, do one random thing related to ads. And there's not a lot of advertisers, but they make a lot of our money. And so when something they do fails, it's really important, but it might not show up in our logs. It might not show up in the same way that say, if I can't post on my newsfeed, that will show up much more easily in our logs. And so what we'll, see, what we'll see happen is a team will come in and they'll say, you know, we should really be monitoring feature acts better. We should, we should do a much better job at managing like this sp specific ads creation flow. And the problem with this is that's great. Like that you'll monitor that flow and if it fails again, you'll notice it. But Overall, the next time something fails, it might not be that specific feature that fails. It might not be that team that experiences the failure. And so it's really important to think about the, the, the action items you come up with as being company-wide. So in this example, maybe a better action item was we should really figure out a way to determine small but important features in our product and automatically monitor the error rates for all of them. And so this is the kind of action item that a team off might not bring itself to the incident review, and that's really important for someone who's experienced, who's on the team that's reviewing it. Um, often they need to kind of poke and prod and, and you know, push for that kind of action item. So to summarize, at Facebook, we, our, our team, the Web Foundation team, sort of has a dual mission. We have a mission of proactively designing abstractions that make our site more reliable, and making, it, making the easiest way to build a service the, the most scalable way. And we have a reactive mission that when there is an incident, avoid, getting, avoid having people get stuck by um, you know, just micro locking into a specific part of the incident response and helping them keep the big picture in mind. And taking the lessons from those incidents that we have and using them in our proactive mission to better monitor incidents um, and to better and to learn lessons that proactively make the site better.